Hello, and welcome to this episode of Beyond the Readme, where we're going to take a look at Kubernetes volume snapshots. We'll take a look at the underlying API resources, understand how they fit together, and then look at some practical examples of snapshots. So what is a snapshot? If you take a look at the Kubernetes documentation, it defines them as a way to provide users with a standardized way to copy a volume's contents at a particular point in time without creating a new volume. And the example they use is a database administrator that wants to create a backup before they do something potentially destructive. So what does this actually mean in practice? Well, most storage systems, if you consider AWS EBS or an on-premises storage device, have some way to create a snapshot at a given point in time. Future writes to the underlying storage don't impact that snapshot, and you can often take that snapshot and restore it. Kubernetes has certain custom resource definitions, or CRDs, that allow you to manage snapshots. Again, these are custom resource definitions. They're not part of the core API, so they need to be enabled by some kind of add-on, like a container storage interface that supports snapshots. The API objects are volume snapshot, volume snapshot content, and volume snapshot class, and we're going to take a look at those. The Kubernetes team themselves provide a snapshot controller and a snapshot or sidecar that can be deployed alongside your container storage interface plugin and enables management of these snapshots. On the topic of the CSI, it's important to understand that not all CSI plugins support snapshots. So if you want to use snapshot functionality, you want to make sure your CSI plugin and drivers support that. So what do these API objects actually look like? Well, it turns out that those three API objects that are provided as CRDs are very similar to the traditional persistent volume API objects that you're probably used to using. So let's look at them side by side. On the left side of this diagram, I have my traditional API objects for managing storage. A storage class provides a way to encapsulate parameters for a user's storage request so that you can offer different types of storage for different workloads. A user might then request a storage class for production that might get provisioned on faster storage, whereas development-based requests might get provisioned on slower storage. Persistent volume claims are requests for storage, and if that request is valid and can be satisfied, a persistent volume will be created in response to that PVC. The persistent volume is the actual underlying storage that's provisioned and then mounted inside of, say, a container. On the right side of the diagram, we have our API objects for volume snapshots. A volume snapshot class is very much like a storage class. It defines certain parameters for that snapshot. And you might wonder why you really need this at all. Why can't you just rely on the underlying storage class that the original storage is provisioned on? Well, you might have some parameters that you want to be unique to your snapshots. For example, your storage class might want to retain storage after it's deleted, just to be on the safe side, whereas your snapshot class might be okay with just deleting snapshots if a user wants them deleted. The volume snapshot is analogous to the persistent volume claim. It's a request to create a snapshot. And if that request is valid, it will result in a volume snapshot content, which is the actual snapshot representation on the underlying storage system. So that EBS snapshot in AWS, or that snapshot in the on-prem storage system you're using. Now, of course, both persistent volumes and volume snapshot content can be created manually. But for this video, we're going to look at persistent volume claims and volume snapshots, where those underlying objects are automatically provisioned in response to a request. So if you'd like to follow along with this, you can set up your environment in Minikube, and I'll provide a link to all of the Kubernetes manifests I use inside of the show notes. And setting up Minikube is pretty straightforward, but there are a few additional steps we need to take to make Minikube work with volume snapshots. So you can start by starting up Minikube just as you normally would. And once Minikube is up and running, you need to enable the CSI host path driver and the volume snapshots add-ons. And once those add-ons are enabled, you can look at the custom resource definitions in the cluster, and you'll see those three CRD API objects that we talk about related to managing volume snapshots. You can also take a look at the volume snapshot classes that are provided. And we can see that we have one class, the CSI host path snap class. So that's the class we'll use in our volume snapshots. So now that we have a cluster ready to support snapshots, let's take a look at a practical example. So imagine we have an Nginx workload with a persistent volume that's mounted to collect the log files at var log Nginx, the traditional location where Nginx sends its logs to. Imagine I want to do some parsing on these logs, but I don't want to impact the production workload. What I can do is create a snapshot of that volume, which represents a specific point in time, and then I can provision a new persistent volume from that snapshot. 
I can then mount that persistent volume like any other volume. In this case, I'll mount it inside of a log processing job. So let's see how we can do that. So the first thing I'm gonna do is provision my Nginx app, and I have a deployment.yaml file that contains all the resources necessary for that. So first I have a persistent volume claim, which is pretty straightforward. I'm requesting just a normal persistent volume to mount on my Nginx pod. Then inside of the pod spec, you can see I mount my persistent volume at var log Nginx, and I also expose this with a service. And while I'm waiting, I'll jump over to another terminal and open up the Minikube tunneler so that that service endpoint can be exposed. It looks like my pod is now up and running, which means if I look at my PVC and my persistent volume, I'll see that that claim has been satisfied and the volume has been bound inside of that pod. If I take a look at my service, we can see that I have my Nginx service exposed on an external IP. And I'm gonna grab that IP address and just make sure I can reach it. And it looks like I can, I get back the Nginx page. So now what I'm gonna do is just send some requests so we have some data in those log files. I'm just going to send a random number of requests between one and a thousand to that endpoint. I'll give that a second to finish. And once that's done, I'll do the same thing again, but now I'll send a random number of requests between one and a hundred that are just designed to fail. That... And you can see I get back 404 for these requests. So now we actually have some data in our log file. And we can actually verify that as well by SSHing to our Minikube server and taking a look at the underlying storage that's provisioned. Remember, this is the host path driver, so this storage is being provisioned as a directory on the underlying Kubernetes host. So if I head over to the directory where the host path provisions its storage, we can see that we have one subdirectory in there. And that subdirectory is clearly an Nginx logging directory. It has the access.log and error.log files you would expect to see. So now let's create a point in time snapshot. To do that, I've got another snapshot.yaml file here. And you can see that this resource is a volume snapshot. I give it a name. I specify that class name from the list of volume snapshot classes we had available to us. And I also specify a source. And for the source of this snapshot, I'm specifying the persistent volume claim name that I used when I created that PVC. And you can see that persistent volume claim name here matches the persistent volume claim name I'm using in the snapshot. So let's go ahead and create this snapshot. So now that that snapshot has been created, we can take a look at it. You can see that snapshot has been created and it's being indicated as ready to use. So I could start using the snapshot to create a volume. You'll also recall that a volume snapshot is a request for a snapshot but the actual underlying snapshot is a volume snapshot content. And if I take a look at the volume snapshot content, we can see that has been created and is ready to use as well. Now remember that volume snapshot content represents the actual snapshot on the underlying storage system. So if I take a closer look at this snapshot, I should be able to see some information about that underlying snapshot. If we describe that volume snapshot content, the interesting thing I wanna look at here is the volume handle. So if we head back over to our Minikube host, and I take a look at what's in my CSI driver directory, you can see I now have a snap file here. And you'll notice that the name of that snap file matches the name of the volume handle specified in the volume snapshot contents. So this ties those two together. That volume snapshot content is a representation of that snapshot on the underlying storage system. And of course, in this example, since we're using the host path driver, this just creates files on the file system. But in EBS or in some other storage system, that would actually create and represent the snapshots in those storage systems. So now we have this snapshot, let's actually create a persistent volume from it and bind it to some workload. So I'm actually gonna delete that snapshot. And we'll recreate it here in a second. I have another manifest that represents the job to parse the logs. And in this case, I'm using the wonderful Go Access Log Analyzer to create an HTML report from Nginx logs. So let's look at this manifest. I have the same volume snapshot we just looked at, but now I have a persistent volume claim. And what's interesting about this persistent volume claim is that if you look at the data source, the kind is set to volume snapshot, and the name matches the name of my snapshot that I'm creating. So now what I'm doing is creating a snapshot and then requesting that a new volume be provisioned based on that snapshot. So my new volume will represent a point in time snapshot of that underlying storage. Then I define my job 
and I mount that persistent volume inside of my job at the logs directory. And my job just runs the go access utility and sends the logs over to it to spit out some HTML. So let's go ahead and create these resources. Now if I take a look at my persistent volume claims, we can see I have my new claim for log parsing. And if you look at my persistent volumes, you can see that claim has been bound. And if I check the status of my jobs, I can see that my job is completed. And if we look at our pods, we can see that that log parser has completed running. So now I'll grab the logs from that job execution. And you can see this looks like an HTML report that was generated by Go Access. So I'm going to send that to a report.html file and open it up in a browser. And that report looks like it's valid for all of the requests. We can clearly see the requests, both valid and invalid, from some of the example requests I sent to my server. And this report represents an obvious parsing of the Nginx log files. So we can see that we were successfully able to snapshot that Nginx log volume and then create a new volume based on that point in time, mount it into an entirely different container, and then perform some work on that volume without ever impacting the production data. And remember, that snapshot represents a point in time view of the underlying storage. So let's go back over to our mini cube for a second. And you can see that we have that snapshot, and now we have an additional volume here. So if I do a quick MD5 sum here of the access.log file in my actual Nginx volume, and then I'll do the same thing with the access.log file in the volume created from the snapshot. And we can see that those checksums match because we haven't sent any additional requests to that HTTP server. So nothing has changed on the original storage volume. Well, let's send another request to Nginx really quickly. Now that new request should be in the access.log file. And if I look at the checksum for Nginx's access log file, we can see it's changed. So that original file has changed. The file that's currently mounted inside that Nginx pod has changed. But the volume created for my snapshot remains the same. And so this is a bit of a contrived example. You would typically send your logs to an upstream log parsing utility, but it kind of gives you an idea of how you can create a point in time view of some storage, create a new volume based on that point in time view, and then work with that data without ever impacting the real production workload. Kubernetes 1.26 is going to bring the ability to provision persistent volumes from cross namespace snapshots. So you could actually have this persistent volume for the log job inside of a totally different namespace from the original snapshot, which will add an additional layer of separation. So I really like volume snapshots. They're a great way to add some data protection capabilities to Kubernetes. And in this video, you took a look at the underlying API objects and then saw some practical examples of how you might work with snapshot objects. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Beyond the Readme. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe, hit like, and send it to your colleagues. We'll see you on the next one.